In the early hours of August 2, 2015, precisely at 3 a.m., an urgent call was made to 911. Tom Martins, an older gentleman, reported in a frantic tone that his son-in-law, Jason Corbett, had assaulted his daughter, Molly. To protect her, Tom intervened and struck Jason on the head with a baseball bat. He mentioned Jason was bleeding heavily and might already be deceased. He urgently requested an ambulance to their location. Jason Corbett, a 39-year-old businessman from Limerick, Ireland, was known for his cheerful and kind personality. He had a twin brother named Wayne and a sister named Tracy. In 2003, at the age of 27, Jason married Margaret Fitzpatrick. They soon welcomed a son named Jack and a daughter named Sarah. Their family life appeared idyllic in Ireland until tragedy struck. In 2006, not long after Sarah's birth, Margaret experienced a severe asthma attack in the middle of the night. She woke Jason up, struggling to breathe. Despite Jason's efforts to help with medication and an inhaler, her condition deteriorated. In desperation, he called for an ambulance. However, Margaret sadly passed away en route to the hospital. At just 30 years old and serving as the director of a small packaging company in Ireland, Jason was left to raise their children, his two-year-old son and three-month-old daughter, alone. His friends noted his profound sadness and struggle following this loss. A year after Margaret's passing, Jason sought help with childcare and housekeeping duties. This led him to hire Molly Martins, a 25-year-old American woman. Molly arrived in Ireland from the United States in March 2008. A longtime friend of Jason's met her at the airport, but immediately harbored reservations about her suitability for the role of nanny and housekeeper. Molly appeared much younger than her age suggested and had a rather flamboyant style, sporting a bright coat with a fur collar, along with cowboy boots and heavy makeup. To this friend, she seemed more like someone out of theater than fitting for such significant responsibilities. Molly Martins grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee. She left Clemson University and decided to start afresh in Ireland. Molly quickly formed a strong bond with Jason's son and daughter, showing tenderness and care. Soon, Jason's close friends noticed a change. He was gradually healing after the loss of his first wife, appearing more lively and engaged. Feelings blossomed between Jason and Molly, leading to a romantic relationship. The couple, along with Jack and Sarah, enjoyed a vacation together. They had a wonderful time, growing closer while planning their future life. Two years later, on Valentine's Day 2010, Jason invited Molly to a cafe where he proposed with a ring. Overjoyed, Molly began planning their wedding in America. She persuaded Jason to move to her home country, and he agreed. In 2011, Jason sold his house and relocated his job to the United States. The family settled in Davidson County, North Carolina, where Jason and Molly married in a ceremony attended by many relatives and friends from both America and Ireland. After their marriage, Molly worked as a swimming instructor, but mainly focused on caring for Jack and Sarah. Meanwhile, Jason held a managerial position in the United States. Initially happy, their marital relationship eventually began to deteriorate. This growing tension peaked on August 1, 2015, when Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon Martins, visited the Corbett family's home at around 11 p.m. Jason welcomed them in the driveway and helped with their luggage. Tom brought a baseball bat as a gift for Jack, Jason's son, who was out at a party with friends at the time. That evening, Jason, Molly, her parents, and Sarah had dinner together. They opted for pizza. Jack returned home close to midnight. However, Tom decided not to give him the baseball bat at such an hour, but intended to present it later instead. The following morning, after 11 p.m., the family retired for the night. Molly and Jason slept in the master bedroom on the first floor with the children, Jack and Sarah, in adjacent rooms. Molly's parents were accommodated in the guest room on the second floor. In the early of August 2nd, around 3 a.m., Tom Martins called 911. He claimed that his son-in-law, Jason, had attacked Molly and that he had struck Jason with a baseball bat in response. Tom urgently requested assistance, unsure of Jason's condition, who lay unconscious and bleeding. 
The 911 dispatcher guided Tom and Molly through cardiopulmonary resuscitation procedures in an effort to revive Jason before medical help arrived. When police and ambulance services arrived 10 minutes later, they found Molly outside near a car appearing distraught and in shock, but without actual tears. Inside, they discovered the lifeless body of 39-year-old Jason Corbett in the main bedroom. Blood spattered across the bed, walls and floor. Both Tom's and Molly's clothing bore blood stains while blood marked Jason's body. Near Jason lay a baseball bat and a large cobblestone, both with traces of blood, as well as an overturned lamp. Throughout this ordeal, Jack and Sarah remained asleep in their rooms. Tom and Molly did not deny their involvement in Jason's death, asserting it was self-defense. They were taken to the station for questioning. At the police station, 66-year-old Tom Martins, an FBI veteran with 30 years of experience, stated that his son-in-law was insane and constantly tormented his daughter. According to Tom, Jason was drunk that evening. Everyone went to bed, but Tom woke up at night because he heard screams and loud voices on the first floor of the house. He jumped out of bed, grabbed a baseball bat, and ran downstairs. Tom entered the main bedroom and saw Jason holding Molly by the throat with both hands. He yelled at Jason to let her go, to which Jason turned to him and said he would kill her. Tom claimed his protective instincts kicked in instantly, so he hit Jason with the baseball bat, but noted that their forces were unequal. Jason didn't appear to feel the blow as he tried to drag Molly into the bathroom and shut the door. However, Tom intervened. Jason pushed the elderly man, making him fall and causing his glasses to fly off. Tom confessed that at that moment, he believed he was going to be. Jason spotted the bat on the floor and reached for it. At that point, Molly grabbed a stone and shouted, don't touch my dad. Then, she struck her husband on the head with all her might. Following that, Tom seized the baseball bat and began hitting Jason until he fell to the floor. During questioning, 32-year-old Molly Corbett recounted the same story to investigators. She explained that her daughter Sarah woke up during the night screaming from night terrors. This woke Jason, who became very angry and lashed out at his wife. He started strangling her, threatening to kill her. Her father came to Molly's aid. Molly admitted hitting her husband on the head with a heavy stone to save her father. When asked where she got the stone, Molly replied that it had been on her bedside table. They had planned to paint cobblestones with their children for decorating flower beds with colorful stones. The woman couldn't recall how many times she hit her husband. She only mentioned it was a desperate fight for survival. Midway through the interrogation, Molly expressed enduring pain from being choked by her husband. Investigators photographed her neck, which bore a red mark in its center. Later, police compared these photos with those taken during her arrest and found no red marks on Molly's neck at detention time. She confessed that while there had been a fight between herself and her husband the day before the tragedy, it was then when Jason grabbed her by the arms and neck. Throughout questioning, she frequently complained of throat pain. Both Tom and Molly claimed in unison that Jason Corbett had been treating his wife brutally. However, his family provided conflicting accounts. Tracy Lynch, Jason Corbett's sister, shared insights about what she described as an unusual relationship between them. Dynamics observed during Jason's wedding to Molly indicated Molly exerted considerable control over Jason often becoming upset if things didn't align with her expectations. Her reluctance to interact with Jason's visiting relatives raised further concerns. Additional alarm was added by the revelation of one of Molly's friends. This friend stated that Molly told everyone she had been friends with Jason's first wife, Margaret, until Margaret died of cancer. This contradicted family reports as everyone knew she had died of an asthma attack. Despite these red flags and attempts by Jason's family and friends to dissuade him from marrying Molly due to her odd behavior, the wedding proceeded. This event marked the beginning of a complicated and troubled union. Initially, Molly and Jason Corbett's marriage appeared harmonious. Molly formed a close bond with Jason's children, Jack and Sarah, treating them as her own. However, 
As their first wedding anniversary approached in 2012, Jason expressed a desire to return to Ireland, his homeland, citing unhappiness in a foreign country. This disclosure marked the beginning of a decline in the couple's relationship. Despite Jack and Sarah referring to Molly as their mother, Jason resisted Molly's intentions to legally adopt them. He wanted to preserve the memory of their biological mother. During this period, Molly's behavior started to change noticeably. Jason grew increasingly concerned about her mental well-being, suspecting she might have a psychological disorder. He observed a stark contrast between her initially sweet demeanor and subsequent behavior, which he perceived as more manipulative and controlling. Molly began isolating Jason from his family, often curtailing his phone conversations with them to mere seconds. Following the untimely death of his first wife, Jason Corbett designated his sister, Tracy Lynch, as the legal guardian for his children, Jack and Sarah. In the event of his own demise, Tracy was well aware that if something to Jason, Molly would strongly contest the custody of the children. When Jason passed away, Tracy promptly traveled to North Carolina to file for custody, anticipating a legal battle with Molly, who also sought custody rights. During their strained marriage, Molly had sought legal counsel to understand her rights over Jason's children in the event of a divorce. Her lawyer advised her to document their disputes and accumulate incriminating evidence against Jason. Consequently, Molly began secretly recording their conversations. In these recordings, Molly appeared disengaged, often ignoring Jason's repeated questions while he escalated his voice. A close friend of Molly's disclosed that although Molly rarely discussed her marital issues, she began to express negative sentiments about Jason following his death. Molly confided in her friend that Jason was domineering and abusive. She accused him of forcing her into intimate acts, verbally abusing her, and progressively worsening in his treatment towards her. Despite these allegations, Molly did not report these incidents to the authorities. Four days after Jason Corbett's tragic demise, his children Jack and Sarah, aged 10 and 8, were interviewed by a child welfare professional. In this interview, they shared observations about the relationship between their parents. Notably, they mentioned their mother Molly being cautious about not waking their father Jason, fearing it might anger him. Jack specifically talked about a cobblestone kept on the bedside table. He clarified that they had brought the stone inside due to rain, intending to decorate it later. Regarding their parents' interactions, both Jack and Sarah described incidents where they witnessed physical altercations initiated by their father against Molly. They recounted occasions where Jason physically assaulted Molly, including hitting and pushing her, and frequently snapping at her over minor issues. Subsequent to these revelations, Jack and Sarah were temporarily placed under the care of their biological relatives. Aunt Tracy Lynch, who had traveled from Ireland, stayed in a North Carolina hotel during the unfolding custody battle. By the time Jason Corbett's autopsy was completed, it revealed the grim details of his demise. The cause of death was a traumatic brain injury. Jason had suffered approximately 12 strikes to the head with both a baseball bat and a brick. These blows were concentrated on the same area, leading to his scalp being severely torn from his skull and his skull itself being fractured. Notably, the medical examiner concluded that at least one of these strikes was inflicted after Jason had already passed away. The toxicology report provided additional insights. It indicated that Jason's blood contained slightly higher than normal levels of alcohol. Additionally, traces of trazodone, an antidepressant medication commonly prescribed for insomnia, were also found in his system. Jason Corbett was laid to rest in his hometown Limerick, Ireland, alongside his first wife, Margaret. Their shared tombstone is adorned with a wedding photograph, serving as a poignant reminder of their lives and the bond they shared. 16 days after Jason Corbett's passing, his sister Tracy Lynch took his children Jack and Sarah to Ireland, separating them from their stepmother Molly. Molly was left in a state of shock and despair upon discovering that Jack and Sarah had been taken to another country. She attempted to reach out to them through phone calls and social media posts, hoping these messages would somehow reach the children. 
Meanwhile, Molly and Tom consistently maintained that their actions against Jason were in self-defense. However, the investigation into Jason's death was ongoing. Tracy Lynch believed in a different motive. She speculated that Molly was aware of Jason's plans to leave her and take their children with him. Tracy surmised that on the night of the incident, Jason had informed Molly of his decision. Out of fear and loneliness, Molly reacted violently. In Ireland, Jack and Sarah received psychological support and gradually adapted to their new environment nine months after their father's tragic demise. They admitted they had been coerced into lying about the alleged domestic violence at home. They revealed that Molly had manipulated them into fabricating stories about their father's behavior, threatening them with the loss of contact with her if they refused to comply. Contrary to their earlier statements, the children clarified that their father had never been abusive toward Molly. During the course of the inquiry, investigators discovered Molly Corbett's past connection with her ex-partner, Keith Magan. He provided several insightful details regarding her earlier life. Keith and Molly initially connected through a dating website, quickly falling for each other at their first meeting. They moved in together just six weeks later. Keith acknowledged Molly's independent spirit, jovial nature, and unique personality. However, she eventually disclosed her struggle with bipolar disorder to him. Keith wasn't overly worried about this revelation since Molly was on medication and generally stable, except for occasional shifts in behavior when she missed her doses. She wasn't violent or prone to outbursts, but would insist on not letting Keith leave during disputes. Molly often spent extended periods in the bathtub, then sat on the cold floor weeping. Despite these challenges, they continued their lives together without plans for children. Molly informed Keith she was on contraceptives, but unexpectedly declared they were expecting a child. At this point, Keith, the family's sole earner, faced financial strain and felt unprepared for parenthood. His discovery of an unopened pack of contraceptives in Molly's wardrobe led him to realize her deceit. Yet Keith, being an honorable man, proposed to Molly, who accepted joyfully. Undeterred by her health issues, she maintained her regimen of antidepressants and other medications, sometimes taking up to 16 pills daily, which caused Keith concern for their unborn child's well-being. Molly once dreamt of losing the baby, and tragically, the following day, the hospital confirmed the fetus's demise. This incident further strained their relationship. Molly plunged into profound mourning and was diagnosed with severe depression, as documented in her medical records. Her parents began supporting her more fervently and, simultaneously, developed a disdainful view of Keith, casting him as the antagonist. In early 2008, Molly informed her fiancé of her plan to go to Europe to find work as a nanny or house assistant. By March, she packed her belongings and left the apartment she had been renting with her fiancé. Ten days later, Molly called Keith to tell him she was in Ireland, had found a job, and everything was fine. From that point on, they never spoke or saw each other again. Keith Magan first heard from a North Carolina detective in October 2015 via email. Through this communication, he discovered the unfortunate events that had unfolded. It was revealed that Molly had kept her significant relationship engagement and subsequent departure to another country a secret from everyone. Keith admitted that upon viewing an interview featuring Tom and Molly, in which they portrayed the late Justin Corbett as malevolent and dreadful, he found their story unconvincing and, moreover, perceived their expressions as merely facades. In January 2016, half a year following Jason's demise, Tom and Molly were unexpectedly indicted for second-degree murder. By July 2017, two years since the incident, the father and daughter duo faced their trial together. They maintained their stance of having acted in self-defense in Jason's killing. During the trial, Tom Martin claimed his actions were what any true father would do, protect his daughter. He believed it was a life or death situation and did all he could to safeguard both Molly and himself. Tom confessed he was the one who struck Jason with a bat, ceasing only when he felt sure Jason no longer posed a threat. 
the prosecution contended in court that the severity of the blows indicated deep-seated animosity, not mere self-defense. An expert analyzing the bloodstains deduced that some strikes were dealt when Jason's head was 30 to 50 centimeters off the ground, strongly suggesting Tom continued to strike him even when he was down and no a threat. Bloodstains on Molly's pajama bottom suggested she was close to Jason during these blows. A long, light-colored hair, possibly Molly's, was found in John's hand, but it wasn't tested. The autopsy revealed defensive wounds on John's left hand, but none on his right. This is significant because he might have used his right hand to grab Molly by the throat. During the trial, Lieutenant Frank Young, assigned to document injuries on Tom and Molly the night of the incident, took the stand. He recalled noticing self-inflicted marks on Molly's neck. Lieutenant Young repeatedly told her to stop and noted that except for dried blood on her cheek, forehead and hair, she had no other injuries. Similarly, Tom had no injuries on the front of his shirt, but blood was found on his watch dial and under his fingernails. His glasses remained intact. Paramedic Mamanda Hackworth also testified. When she arrived at the scene and examined Jason's body, she found his torso already cold with patches of dried blood. This contradicted Molly's claim that they had immediately called 911 after Jason lost consciousness and collapsed. The trial further revealed that Jason Corbett had a life insurance policy naming Molly as the beneficiary. It was also disclosed that Jason often sent money to Molly's parents during his lifetime. For instance, in 2011, he sent $50,000 to Tom, supposedly for wedding expenses. A neighbor came forward during the trial recounting how he and Jason spent an evening together drinking beer from about 3.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. The neighbor described Jason as very relaxed and noted Jason's calm interactions with his in-laws when they arrived at the Corbett residence. He witnessed Tom and his wife arriving with Jason welcoming them and helping carry heavy bags from their car into the house. Finally, a nurse testified about her observations of the couple before this incident occurred. The tragic event unfolded when it was reported that trazodone had been prescribed to Molly a few days before the incident on July 30th, 2015. Jason had visited the hospital two weeks prior to his passing, expressing concerns about frequent dizziness, tension, and unprovoked anger. After nine days filled with witness accounts, debates, and distressing crime scene photographs, the jury reached a verdict in merely three hours. Molly Corbett and her father, Tom Martins, were convicted of second-degree murder and received sentences of 20 and 25 years in prison, respectively. Upon hearing the verdict, Molly turned to her mother with regret in her voice stating, I'm so sorry, but I shouldn't have let him kill me. While it seemed justice had been served for the convicted individuals, the case was far from over. Just an hour after the jury delivered their verdict, a juror disclosed outside the courthouse that discussions about Jason Corbett's case occurred prior to the formal deliberation period. This was a significant breach of legal protocol. In light of this revelation, the defense swiftly submitted a request to overturn the conviction due to juror misconduct. However, this motion was dismissed by the trial court judge. A year later, the defense approached the appellate court, highlighting several investigative errors. One issue raised concerned blood stains on Tom Martin's shorts. The prosecution had suggested these stains belonged to Jason's blood, implying Tom stood over Jason during the assault, but they were never actually tested. The prosecutor argued it was impractical and unnecessary to test every single blood spot. The defense also underscored initial statements made by Jack and Sarah they initially claimed their father was abusive towards them. Molly and expressed fear of him. The defense argued that the siblings' late attractions, were they to lying, were influenced by professionals, assuring them to change their testimony. On 4th, 2020, the North Carolina Court of Appeals determined Tom Martins and Molly Corbett should be granted a new trial. This decision was later upheld by the Supreme Court of North Carolina. Subsequently, both were released on a $200,000 bond. While awaiting the retrial, they were required to hand over their passports and were forbidden from making any contact with Jack and Sarah.
Currently, Jason Corbett's case has been moved to Forsyth County, North Carolina, for additional legal proceedings, marking a minor triumph for Tom and Molly. Jason's children, Jack and Sarah, are now residing with their biological aunt in Ireland. Sarah, aged 16, has authored a series of books aimed at helping others deal with the loss of parents. Tracy Lynch, Jason's sister, has also penned a book about her brother during these years of legal battles. She aims to share the kindness and decency of Jason Corbett with the world. A notable excerpt from Tracy's book reads, Deep down, I smile when I realize that Jason has finally returned to the only place on this earth he ever wanted to be, in the arms of his beloved Margaret. Kelly Clayton had everything going for her. First of all, she was quite smart and bright since high school. She was a role model for other students, active in school, excelled in tests, and passed exams just as well. At the same time, outwardly, she never looked like a girl who spent days and nights sitting over textbooks, cramming lessons, and writing out something from additional literature. No. On the contrary, her looks were considered model-like, and if her grades had left much to be desired, she could have built a modeling career. She could have, but she didn't. After high school, she went to teacher training university to become a chemistry teacher, the insane pride of her parents, but only for the first few years of university. It is not known what turning point happened to her then, but one day, Kelly took her documents from the institution and, calling her parents, said that she no longer wanted to study, that she was too young to spend the rest of her life checking notebooks and raising ungrateful children. If she wants to, she will definitely return to her educational endeavors. In the meantime, she wants to travel and live life to her heart's content. Not the best idea, according to her parents, who were so upset that they didn't communicate with their daughter for six months. But perhaps if it wasn't for this desperate act, Kelly would never have met Tom Clayton. They met at a party of mutual friends and the young man really liked the girl. Firstly, he, from the first minutes of acquaintance, began to court Kelly and show signs of attention. And secondly, Tom had a beautiful appearance and athletic physique. And all because the guy was a hockey star. For four consecutive seasons, he played for the semi-professional team Jackals. And in it, he was considered a strong man a player who was able to break the opponent's ribs only if he did not approach the gate. But only a sports career, and especially built on strength and aggression, will someday fail, and Tom had to put the stick in the far corner and enjoy hockey only from the stands or from the couch, watching his favorite team on the TV screen. The couple had to move on with their lives, and first they returned to New York, where they got married, then moved to North Carolina, and then moved to the tiny town of Cato, numbering only a few thousand people. There, Tom franchised a company to rebuild houses after fires or disasters and worked in a related profession for a friend's company. As for Kelly, after dropping out of university, she worked as a waitress only changing places, and now she had two children. However, Tom was earning well enough, and Kelly could quit her job at any time and take care of her beautiful daughters, but she still believed that extra money would never be superfluous. Besides, she could use it to buy toys for her children and spoil them in every possible way. On September 28, 2015, Tom, as usual, went to play poker with his friends, the Millers. He never took his wife to such events. Playing for money implied certain skills and experience in the game. Besides, someone had to stay at home with the children and a family trip would have turned such gatherings into a noisy buffoonery and would not have brought any pleasure from gambling. That evening, Tom was not lucky in the game, but he did not get up from the table, but on the contrary, tried to win back and offered anyone who wanted to stay to play until morning, but no one supported him and he went home. At home, however, a terrible picture opened before him. His beloved wife was lying in her own pool of blood badly beaten and, at first glance, was not breathing. Tom panicked and ran through the rooms looking for his children and, luckily, they were fine but very frightened. He grabbed his daughters and headed to his neighbor Derek's house, trying to make sure the children didn't see their mother's mutilated body. 
and already from the neighbor's house, he dialed the police number. The officer who arrived on the scene found Tom sitting on his knees in front of his wife's body, trying to give her artificial respiration. Only the EMTs were able to pull the man away, who voiced the terrible and unpleasant information. Kelly had been dead for a long time, and neither they nor he could do anything to help her. All two floors of the house were drenched in blood. A major mess was in the bedroom. Apparently, there had been a struggle between Kelly and the perpetrator who had committed his atrocity, despite the fact that there were children in the house at the time. Kelly was pushed down the stairs, evidenced by the knocked down banister, and beaten on the head with a blunt object until they were sure she was dead. There were no hints of knife or gunshot wounds. The policeman who filmed the crime scene noted to himself that Tom was shocked by what had happened and seemed lost in space. He walked from one corner of the room to another, entered the room for a split second, and immediately left it. And he could not tell the policeman where the children's room was or where the emergency exit from the house was. But when asked where Tom himself was at the time of the murder, he answered calmly that he had been at a friend's house all evening, where they were playing poker. Then the policeman, who did not get any clear information from Tom, went to the neighbors to ask some questions of the children. Tom's eldest daughter, Charlie, referred to the perpetrator as a robber. According to the words of the eldest daughter, she and her sister were almost asleep, but they heard their mother start screaming loudly from the next room, Charlie, run, run away from here. And then the whole place shook like an earthquake. The girls, after listening to their mother, cautiously went out of their room, but saw the criminal leaning over their mother and beating her with what appeared to them to be a hammer. The girls ran back into the nursery, closed the door with a small nightstand and hid under the bed. It was a good thing. The criminal wasn't looking for them because that nightstand, as the policeman pointed out, was so small that it would hardly have apprehended a burglar. Say, what did this burglar look like? Well, he was a big one, like a bear. That big? Wow, what was he wearing? Blue jeans and a black shirt. He was also wearing a mask, you know, like the one daddy wears when he goes hunting with Mr. Bourne to shoot ducks. So your daddy has a mask like that too. Will you show me? I'd have to ask him where it is. I don't know. What else did you notice when you saw the robber? He had eyes like dad's, and I don't remember anything else. I saw him literally just a little bit got scared, and we quickly ran back inside. Police officers checking the house were unable to confirm the girl's account that the perpetrator was a burglar. There were no signs of forced entry at either the front or back door, although on the other hand, the gate to the garage was open and the perpetrator could have entered the house through the garage. Another thing that the police noted is that nothing was stolen from the house. Jewelry was left untouched, lying in a jewelry box, and the safe where Tom kept the cash was not even touched. The doors of the cabinets in the house were also all closed. Usually burglars check every little cabinet, every shelf, but here the whole mess was the aftermath of a fight. Experienced officers, it would seem, understood everything at once. Tom pretends to be a heartbroken husband, and it was he who killed his beloved wife and the mother of his children in order to further receive insurance payments. If Kelly's life was insured and husband's murderers developing a crime plan always insure the life of their wives, then in case of her death, he could get up to a million dollars. All that's needed is to gather evidence and the case will be solved especially since even her own daughter said that the mask on the robber was like her father's and eyes like her father. However, the police did not find the hunting mask in the house. After finding out where Tom had spent his time that night, the police questioned the other poker players. Is Tom the killer? Do you really suspect him? Wondered one of his friends. That poor guy had his wife murdered for crying out loud. And instead of looking for the bastard, you want to pin everything on him? How could you think of such a thing? No, Tom certainly couldn't have done it. I've known him a long time, replied another less emotional friend. He worked two jobs around the clock because he loved both Kelly and his kids. There's just no way that could happen. 
Plus, he was with us all night. We played poker, and even when everyone was tired, he kept insisting on continuing to play. Tom really was suspicious that evening, said his acquaintance, Laura. During a break in the game, he took me into the next room and asked me to give him my phone to call his wife. He supposedly forgot his phone in the car and didn't want to go get it. I was first surprised that the car was 10 meters away from the house. Go to it and get the phone, but still gave him a call. He stepped back to make the call outside. I didn't hear who or what he was talking to, but when I decided to check the outgoing calls, there were no numbers in the call history, so he just deleted the call. Wouldn't you agree that's odd? I told my husband about it, and he was as surprised as I was. My husband was sitting at the playing table next to Tom and noticed that Tom was not watching the process of dealing cards or watching the people around him, which is very important in poker, but was sitting with his head bowed over the surface of the table where the cards were hiding the screen of his phone. He had his phone on him. Why had he tricked me then? Where was he calling? Who couldn't he call from his phone? After Laura's testimony, the police once again questioned Charlie, Tom's daughter, and the girl repeated what she had told the policeman the first time. The robber looked a lot like her father. The next testimony was given by the niece of the murdered, already after Tom was behind bars. I didn't tell Aunt Kelly. I just didn't want to upset her. She was very fond of Tom. She literally loved him. And besides, she has two children by him. They are my sisters. Who needs my truth? Tom was not the man he appeared to be at first glance. Yes, he occasionally spoiled my aunt with attention and flowers. He could easily babysit, which other fathers rarely do. But that was all at home. And at work, he was a completely different person. I've Kelly decided to help me one day and arranged for Tom to take me to work for him. She was too young to be on her own, so she understood me as well as anyone and wanted the best for me. I worked for Tom all last summer, doing correspondence registration and document management. I didn't know him well before that, so at first we had a strictly working relationship. Then he got drunk somewhere and came to the office in that state. There was no one there but me and him and for some reason, he started to tell me that his family was fictitious. He loves his daughters very much, but he doesn't care about his wife, and he hasn't had any feelings for her for a long time. He's even had a few affairs on the side during their marriage, and even considered leaving Aunt Kelly. But he didn't, simply because he was afraid that a divorce might leave him without a house and without money. Looking ahead, it is important to note that some of the interviewed female participants of that evening's poker game confirmed the words of Kelly's niece that Tom was not such a faithful husband and had a sexual relationship with two women who were also playing poker that night. In addition to the information about Tom's promiscuous life, Kelly's 16-year-old niece also told about another employee of Tom's firm, Michael Beard. Michael was doing repair work on houses after the fire, and he was doing a good job. But there was one moment, in those houses where Bird worked, constantly missing things, and if the first few times Tom did not believe his customers, referring to the fact that during the fire, the owners could lose something. Then, when the accusations of theft began to be repeated for the third and fourth time, there was no doubt. Michael Bird not only restores the floor and walls, but also steals. Plus, in addition to stealing, there were complaints that Michael was allowing himself to come to work drunk. I was in the office when Michael's stealing came to light. Tom could yell at his employee and kick him out on the street. He was upset with his subordinate's behavior like that. He kept asking him, how could you? Or, haven't you thought about your family? Where are you going to work now? After the incident, Tom fired Bird, but still called companies he knew and offered them to hire his former employee. Tom recommended Michael, and when all his options were exhausted, Tom took Bird in to help with the household, cutting the grass, watering the plants, doing minor repairs around the house. The detective called Michael Beard in for questioning. He said he only stole because he and his family needed the money. Tom was very good to me. 
defended me to the end. But I know it was my own fault. He has a very good wife. She fed me when I worked for them, even though she really shouldn't have. She also gave my children clothes that her daughters had grown out of. I am very grateful for all they have done for me. I feel so bad for Kelly. When I heard about her death, I couldn't believe my ears. I felt so bad. I even went to church and prayed for her to go to the best of all worlds. The police did not find anything strange in Michael's story and let him go, but the interrogation of his wife, Mrs. Bird, made the police doubt his words. According to his wife, Holly, Tom offered Michael some work, which he did not say, and for this work, he promised to pay him $10,000. Now that was interesting. Michael was called back to the station and had a lie detector hooked up to him. All questions were failed. Bird was lying and therefore failed the test. Realizing he couldn't get away with it, he began to testify. Indeed, Tom promised Bird $10,000 if Michael, on the day when Tom will play poker, sneak into his house, kill his wife, and set a fire in his house. The plan was to strangle Kelly and then make it look like she just burned to death in an accidental fire. Plus, the family home was insured for a very large sum of money. As the police checked, it was true. Kelly's home and life were insured at the highest rate. Two cans of gasoline were waiting for Michael in the garage through which the house was to be entered. Everything was fine here. Bird entered the house when everyone was already asleep. He quietly began to climb the stairs and reach the bedroom where Kelly was supposed to be sleeping. But the young woman was either awake or awakened by the sound of the open door. And when she saw a strange man in the doorway, she began to scream in fright. Michael was just as frightened and pounced on Kelly, trying to close his huge hands around her neck. But it wasn't that easy. Kelly began to fight back. I had no idea that a seemingly fragile Kelly had so much strength in her, says Michael. A heck of a fight ensued, which spilled over from the second floor bedroom to the first floor kitchen. Michael, because of the shock and panic, could not concentrate on the fight, but only waved his arms in all directions or just grabbed Kelly's clothes while Kelly, defending her life, aimed very accurately at Michael's face. And if the police had come to Bird earlier, they would have seen the marks from the beatings on him. But everything turned out as it did. After a long struggle, Michael hit Kelly's head against the wall with all his might. She fell and for a while couldn't find the strength to get up. Michael took out a hammer and began hitting the young woman's head with it until she stopped showing signs of life. Michael, maddened by what had happened, just ran out of the house, even forgetting that Tom asked him not only to kill Kelly, but also to set the house on fire to cover up the crime. Michael had an accomplice, Mark Blantford, who in fact served only as a driver. The day before it happened, I got a call from Michael. I had worked with him on a construction site for a long time, and I had stayed with him for a couple weeks last year, so I knew him well. I knew Michael was into petty theft, so when he called me and asked me to drive while he broke into someone's house, I wasn't surprised. I wanted to turn him down, but he offered me $500. I thought long and hard at first, but he talked me into it. He said he just wanted to rob a businessman and he needed help to get out of there before the cops got there. He said he'd help with the car. I gave in to his entreaties, but on the condition that I park somewhere far away from the house, he agreed. That evening, I waited for him in that car in a dark alley and he came back quickly enough, breathing heavily and telling me to move as fast as possible. He didn't have any bag or sack on him, which didn't look much like a robbery. I didn't ask him any questions along the way, simply because I didn't want to know anything. I just wanted my $500, which, by the way, I didn't end up getting. On the way out, he asked me to stop at a bridge over a creek a couple blocks south of here. I stopped there. He hastily stripped off his outer garments and threw them off the bridge. If you need to be shown the place, I'll show you. Indeed, police officers who arrived on the scene at Mark's behest found parts of Michael's outer clothing near the creek as well as the hammer used to kill Kelly. 
Michael, already in custody on suspicion of first-degree murder, began to change his testimony. According to him, he was indeed hired by Tom, indeed for $10,000, but only to commit arson at the house and nothing more. There was no question of murder. When he went into the house, however, Kelly was already dead. And who killed her? The detective asked. I think it was Tom. He offered me money for murder and arson from the beginning, but I refused the first offer. I'm not willing to kill a man for any money. He said I had nothing to fear, but he never could talk me into it. You may not believe me, but I almost lost my mind when I saw Kelly's body. I knew right then and there that he was setting me up, so I ran out of the house. He's the killer, Michael insisted. Michael spent a very long time assuring the police of his innocence, and all because he did not know that Mark had shown the place where Bird had thrown out his things, and that his clothes, as well as the murder weapon, had already been submitted for examination, and the experts found both on his clothes and on the hammer, the blood of Kelly Clayton. And that was the most direct proof that it was him who killed Kelly, not someone else. In turn, Tom also did not admit that it was he who ordered the massacre of his wife from a former problem employee of his company. According to him, Michael knew that he had money, knew that he was not poor, and because Bird lost his job, as well as because of resentment associated with the dismissal, he decided to rob his house. But Kelly was at home that night, for which he paid with his life. It might have been difficult to prove Tom's guilt and his conspiracy with Michael if Laura, the woman who had been playing poker that night, had not told the police that Tom had called from her cell phone. The detective requested a transcript of her calls and expectations were confirmed. Then, on the night of September 28th, 29, Tom Clayton called Michael Beard. Michael was the first to go to trial. He continued to insist that he had been hired to set fire to the house in order to collect the insurance payout. He didn't kill Kelly, and as for the blood on his clothes, it was just because he was touching a dead and mutilated body. That's why he got dirty. He'd thrown his stuff away so no one would think he'd been at Clayton's house that night. His speech sounded convincing. The jury had been deliberating for seven hours. In the end, they concluded that Michael Beard was guilty on all counts. He was facing life in prison. As for Tom, his lawyers were able to obtain records of conversations and correspondence between him and Michael, and none of the conversations clearly discussed their devious plan. The prosecution's requests for billing transcripts of his movements yielded no concrete results either. All the evidence was circumstantial. If it weren't for one nuance, the car in which Mark had given Michael a ride was registered to Tom's company, and Tom, coming to the office on his personal Toyota, left it in the parking lot, where for some reason moved to the company pickup truck, which later drove to Michael's house and left there and took back the day after the tragedy. That is, in fact, he gave Michael the car on which he and Mark went to the crime. It was this fact that was testified to at the trial by the jury. The trial lasted six days, and the jury concluded that Tom had hired Michael to commit this horrible crime after all. Michael, in turn, filed an appeal. In his defense, he used the words of little Charlie, who said that the eyes in the slit of the mask belonged to her father. However, the court rejected the appeal because the description of the clothes matched the one found under the bridge. As a result, Tom Clayton and Michael Beard received life sentences. As for Mark, he was charged with manslaughter, for which he received four years in prison. Tom and Kelly's children were given custody to Kelly's sister, Kim. After some time, Charlie has moved on from the tragedy. She occasionally remembers her mom, but absolutely won't talk about her father, who she will never see again. Corpus Christi resident Kevin Davis strangled his mother before hitting her in the head with a hammer, splitting her skull. Davis then swirled her brain around before sexually assaulting her corpse. Davis was sentenced to life in prison for the crime of a mom who he described as the best. In 2014, Kevin Jasrell Davis argued with his mother, 50-year-old Kimberly Hill, in the Corpus Christi, TX, apartment he shared with her and his sister, Destiny. On May 26th, Davis called 911, reporting that he'd just murdered his mother. Once at the police station, 
An 18-year-old Davis vividly detailed the day's events, sometimes with a smirk on his face. What he told detectives was gruesome and shocking. Kevin admitted bashing in Hill's head with a hammer, swirling her brain around, and then sexually assaulting her corpse. On the morning of March 27, 2014, Davis, bored and frustrated with life, told his mother he did not like people and that he wanted to commit suicide. Obviously caught off guard by the statement, Hill allegedly told her son that she could not stop him if that was what he wanted to do. Kevin later told police hearing this from his mother enraged him. It was then he decided to take her life. As Hill sat on the couch in the living room, Davis came up behind her, attempting to strangle her with a cord. Hill began screaming. Kevin panicked, retreated a hammer, and began bashing in his mother's skull. Davis struck his mother in the head with the hammer at least 20 times, splitting her skull in the process. Davis then retreated a kitchen knife that he inserted inside his mother's head wound. He swirled her brain around to make sure she was dead, Kevin claimed, and then inserted his hand inside the wound. He would tell detectives during a taped interrogation that his mother's brain felt like putty. Kevin then dragged his mother's lifeless body to her bedroom and raped her corpse. When he finished the sadistic act, he went to a neighbor's house, saying he just killed someone and needed help. The neighbor dialed 911. Police arrested Davis without incident. At the police station, he made a full confession of the crime, giving details that even seasoned detectives found highly disturbing. Watch part of Tevin Davis's confession. During the interrogation, Davis told detectives that he originally planned on killing his sister, too, but changed his mind. He further admitted that he often fantasized about having sex with dead bodies. With a smirk on his face, Kevin also told the detective that he was a virgin before he raped his mother. He stated, I guess I've lost my virginity to a corpse, as he gently laughed. What did Kimberly Hill do to warrant such a violent death? Nothing more in his son murdering and sexually assaulting his mother, of course, and Kevin could not give detectives one good reason for the crime. According to Kevin, she was a great mom that did not deserve what he had done to her. He said that she was the best mother in the world and went on to say, I am a terrible, disgusting person. Kevin admitted that he had the best mother in the world, telling detectives that she did nothing to deserve what was done to her. He went on to say that he was a terrible, disgusting person. In reality, Kevin was a serial killer in the making, a psychopath who took sadistic pleasure in hurting other people. Although diagnosed by a psychologist with antisocial personality disorder, the doctor said he knew right from wrong when he brutally murdered and raped his mother. He readily admitted that he would tell again if ever released from prison. He also confessed to then fleeing the crime scene on his bicycle. Before he did that, though, he left several handwritten notes for the police, one of which read, Chase me. Sorry for the mass. KD. But, after a while, he decided against leaving town and called 911 to report his mother's killing and his crimes. Despite admitting to the murder and making a videotaped confession, Kevin Davis pleaded not guilty to the charges in court. He later changed the plea. Davis smiled at the jury as they sentenced him to life in prison. He serves his time at the Jester 4 facility in Richmond, Texas, and is eligible for parole in March 2044. Story number two, story of the killer priest. We will be exploring the story of a killer, a priest that seemed to be normal, nothing strange or nothing weird about him. However, he did have a dark side. It turns out that not only was he a pervert, but he was manipulating people as he saw fit, especially women. And now without further ado, Let's dive into the story of Gore. We're going back in time in the 50s in France, and we need to take note that the church at that time had a very important place in people's lives, especially in the countryside. The priests were almost as important as the mayors because they were representing a type of moral authority that many people listened to. And this was the case in the small village of Europe where this story took place. A town that had about 400 villagers, Gour was born on the countryside, and his family was very Catholic, 
They raised him so that he can have a career in religion as a priest. And even if that was not his first choice, that is exactly what he became. It is in 1950 that Guy became a priest at the Church of Europe in appearance. This young man looked like the ideal priest. He was nice, friendly, kind, and very dynamic. Anything linked to religion, he did it very, very well. He had a lot of great ideas to help the village grow. He created a choir, a group to play in a theater piece. He did organize multiple excursions for the kids, and he was known to have created a soccer team for the boys of the village. The older people thought that it was very modern for him to bring all these items to the village, and the younger generation thought it was pretty amazing and appreciated the modern aspect that he brought to the town and to the religion. Dewar was apparently also a beautiful man, and the ladies found him very charming. Now, as I have mentioned at the beginning, underneath this whole angelic disguise guy was actually hiding a dark secret. His personality, he had a thirst for Kolel pleasure, and he was using his charm to get closer to the ladies. After a lot of perversity and manipulation, a lot of the women actually gave in, and none of the women spoke as they were afraid that no one would believe them and did not want to be seen as the shame of the village. It is in 1953 that things took a different turn for Guy Dyer, and an incident happened that changed the plan of the priest. A girl fell for his charm, and guess what happened? She became pregnant. Now, of course, the priest denies everything, and he says that he is not the father. He threatens the girl and says that if she does not stop, he will file a complaint for defamation. Now, having an eye influence in the village, Guai says that this is nonsense, and it is impossible for him to be the father. And, of course, having such an high influence, his followers believed him. He was even summoned in front of his superior, the bishop to which he lied to you and denied the whole thing. And, of course, this whole situation was shut down in reality. He was actually the father, and he actually took the girl to another village to give birth, where he convinced her to give away the child. And, of course, that story was never heard of or told to the villagers, or we could say maybe presume that if people knew, they decided not to say anything, because the priests had such a high influence on the villagers that they did not want to go against him. Once the story died, Guy went back to his normal ways and kept manipulating the people like he did before. But there was another incident in 1956. Reen Fay's 19 years of age got pregnant, and again by Guy Dyer. Contrary to the other women, Reen did not want to give away her child for adoption. Not only that, but she wanted to raise him in the village of the Uref, where the priest was Guy was terrified and he was afraid that eventually the child would grow up and resemble him. He was also afraid that this woman would actually speak, eventually speaking of which. In 1956, rumors started to make surface. A lot of parishioners were becoming pregnant in mysterious ways, and no one knew who the father was. The priest then starts to think about a plan and ask a military man from another village to come to town and pretend that he was the father. Unfortunately, that strategy did not work out, and no one believed the soldier was the father that only made things worse for the mysterious pregnancies. December 3rd, 1956 is a date that Chang changed everything, for the priest Kai brings Rain in on a deserted road to try and convince her one more time to give up the child she refuses again, and she was tired of the priest's request. So you know what she did. She got out of the car and started to walk back the opposite way back to the village. At night, Guy Deer got out of the car and pulled out a 6.35 caliber pistol and fired three shots. The three shot hit Regine in the back of the neck and she died on the spot. Once the crime committed, the priest walked to the victim and dressed her and took out a knife and started to open Regine's stomach. From her stomach, he removed the baby curl that was still alive. The priest committed again an act that cannot be forgiven. He strangled the baby, stabbed it, disfigured it, and he did all the thinking to himself that if the baby is massacred that way, there would be no way, no DNA, if you want to call it that way, no DNA to trace the baby back to him. The disappearance of Regine was actually reported in the evening, and the weird part is that the priest joined the search party to find a Regine. Can you imagine that situation? I mean, the killer is with you in the search party trying to find the person that he just murdered. 
Is it just me or that is just like twisted? The body was found very quickly and because the priest was not an assassin, he didn't, you know, think about cleaning up the crime scene so it didn't take long for the cops to find the murder weapon and they found the weapon casing that linked back to the priest. So the priest is now a suspect and when asked during the interrogation the priest denied everything however because of all the pressure he was getting, he just cracked and admitted everything. Now that story came out and everyone was devastated in France because he is now a criminal and the church asked for Guy to be locked up with a false name so that it would not affect the church and also the main reason was to make sure that the crime was not associated to the church. The court addressed the case of Guy de Noyer on January 24, 1958. Of course the villagers and the public opinion wanted the priest to be sentenced to death. The life of Guy was defined as a person that did enjoy luxury sexual relations and admired his own authority, and on his side, the priest was asking forgiveness because he had no clue what he did wrong. The jury did provide their verdict and for most, they said that he was guilty of double murder. Of course there was Regine and the baby, however they did not want to sentence him to death, the jury did not want to send someone associated to the church to the scaffold. The priest Guy de Neuer was therefore sentenced to perpetrated work. Now that situation raised a lot of questions regarding the responsibility of the Catholic Church and this is still a question that is being asked nowadays especially for the priests who like other kids, if you know what I mean. There was an investigation that was done and the report came up saying that the church knew the dark side that he was hiding before he was pronounced priest. His superiors noticed that he did not have a lot of faith and he was not really a believer in Catholic religion. The investigation did show that before being priest in a Europe, he was sent to Blemont. While he was there, he did have a sexual relation with his parishioner, and instead of removing his status, they just transferred him to another city. Even there, his weakness for women did not stop as he did have multiple sexual relations. You would think that the church would revoke his status, but instead he was just transferred to Europe where the church was isolated and his temptations might be lower. But as we have seen, this was not the case. De Neuer was released in 1972. After being detained for 22 years, he was the oldest prisoner of France. Once again, the church came to his help after he was released from prison. He was welcome in a monastery in Brittany, or he stayed there until he died on April 21, 2010, at 90 years of age. Now we go to story number three. Family slaughtered at Wells Great Provincial Park. The killer stalked the family while he let his violent fantasies run wild. Three generations of a family left to go camping on August 2nd, 1982. They set up camp in the Welsh Great Provincial Park. Located roughly 120 kilometers north of Kamloops in central British Columbia. They enjoyed several days of cloudy family time. Picking berries during the day and gathering around the fire at night having no idea that they were being stalked by a killer. Among the campers was grandparents Edith, 59, and George Bentley, aged 66. Their daughter Jackie, 41, and son-in-law Bob Johnson, 44. Also the Johnson's daughters Janet, 13, and Karen, just 11. The Johnsons drove up with their daughters and pitched a tent for the girls. The grandparents brought a truck and camper where the adults would stay. The last anyone heard from the family was on August 6th, when Edith called another daughter. It would not be until August 23rd that the family would first be reported missing. Bob Johnson was due back at work on August 16th, but didn't show. After a week with no word from him, his company filed a missing persons case with the police. In spite of an extensive search, it didn't result in finding any of the family members. The biggest problems were the tiller had a head start with plenty of time to kill, get rid of the victim's bodies, and cover his tracks. The other maybe even bigger obstacle was, no one knew exactly where the family was camping at. All anyone knew was that the family was camping in the Wells Gray area, which is massive. They had no idea where to even start, let alone being able to follow a trail to find the family. It would take three more weeks and a mushroom picker to find the family. On September 13th, the current discovery of the Johnson's 1979 Plymouth was found. It had been burned beyond recognition as it set off to the side of a mountainside logging road. 
The car held the bodies of the four adults in the back seat and the two young girls in the trunk. The bodies were burned so thoroughly that when it came time to bury the family, they were all placed together in one child-sized casket. Through a forensic examination of the remains, it was determined they had been shot with a .22 caliber firearm. Locals were able to tell investigators where they had seen the family camped at. An examination of the area would turn up .22 casings, which helped identify the weapon used as a Remington pump-action rifle. What wasn't at the campsite was the truck and camper, the boat and camping gear brought with the family, or any trace of the family at all. With no suspect in custody or even in sight, the media was pushing for answers. A tip came in that the family's truck and camper had been spotted. The witnesses said it was being driven by two French Canadians in central Canada. The media sprang into action, throwing this up as their headline and demanding the killers to be caught. In April, with still no leave, the investigators knew they needed to get creative. They reenacted what they believed was the crime scene for TV cameras and aired it across Canada. The next month, the police drove a replica Ford camper truck to Ontario and Quebec in an attempt to draw awareness for what people should be looking in a for. What it did instead was flood the investigators with over 13,000 tips and sightings of the replica vehicle. The reward was raised from $7,500 to $10,000 for information leading to the truck. None of the tips led to the discovery of the camper and truck. It would be found by sheer luck. Two forestry employees were working on a logging road and stumbled across it. The camper had sat there on Trophy Mountain for 14 months, only a few kilometers away from the crime scene. The camper was burned out like the car holding the family's bodies. This left the authorities to believe they were looking for someone local to the Wells Gray area, and not two French Canadians as they had been searching for since it was more likely that a local would know about the locking roads and the area in general. Taking a closer look at the person who lived closest to the crime scene led them back to David Rullian Shearing, 24. They had received a tip about him earlier in the investigation. When they followed up, the tipster had quite a bit to tell them. A year earlier, Shearing had asked him about re-registering a Ford truck and how to repair a hole in its door. This was a tip that the police had never divulged after finding the truck, it had a bullet hole in the door. After an interrogation by the Royal Canadian Mode of Police, Shearing confessed. He went so far as reenacting the murders for the detectives. He turned over evidence that he had stolen from the family and the murder weapon, the .22 caliber Remington rifle. The ballistic test would prove that this was the weapon used to kill the family the same weapon that had been hanging on his wall the very first time the authorities went to ask him about the family, right after they had been reported missing. Maybe it was because his father was a prison guard or his brother was a sheriff. But Shearing wasn't suspected when first interviewed. In his confession, he gave details of how it all happened. He had first noticed the family when he set up camp, fixating on the two young girls. Then over the next few days, he watched their every move. On the night of August 10th, Shearing watched as the adults sat around the campfire and had seen the girls go into their tent for the night. From a distance, he took out the four adults with sniper shots. He said he then killed the two girls from their tent as they slept. After he said he loaded all the bodies into the car and moved it to the logging road, then set it on fire with five gallons of gasoline. He then cleaned up the campground removing the family's possessions, including the camper and truck. It would only be later that he burned these as he was unable to transfer them into his name. He claimed that he killed the family because he wanted to rob them of their possessions. It wouldn't be until after Shearing was convicted that he gave his full confession of how and he had been stalking the family. It was the girls that he fantasized about having sex with that kept him interested. That's why after telling the adults he kidnapped the girls and took them to his property nearby. There he raped and terrorized them for over a week. On August 16th, the day their father was due back at work, Shearing took Taryn away from her big sister. 
Once alone, he shot the girl in the back of the head. Janet would be left alive for one more day of torture before she would be killed like her sister. With the girls now dead, he took their bodies to the Johnson's car where the other family members had been placed. He had actually only hidden the car in some bush. He put the girls in the trunk and got into the driver's seat with the four decomposing adult bodies in the back seat. Driving it to its final resting place where it would be found by that mushroom pick for burnt out. David Shearing pled guilty to six counts of murder. Shearing was sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. The maximum penalty for second-degree murder. This would be the first time that this sentence was handed out in Canadian history. David Shearing, who changed his last name to his mother's maiden name of Ennis, was first eligible for parole in 2008. The National Parole Board ruled against his release citing that he was still having violent sexual fantasies and had not completed a sex offender treatment program, so he was not ready to be released. Again in 2012, he was turned down for parole, applying again in 2014, but before his hearing, he withdrew his request. The National Parole Board has also been given a petition which has over 15,000 signatures advocating for the violent offender to never be released. In his own words at one of his parole hearings, David tries to plea for freedom, saying this about himself. I was very selfish. He is supported by his wife that he narrate while in prison, Heather, 